what I want to talk about in this segment of our conversation uh, is the question, why does this matter? Why, why does the reality of evolution as a scientific principle matter for believing Latter-day Saints and, and aspiring disciples? And so, if, if you'll indulge me, I'm going to be personal mm -hmm. uh, at this stage and, and share with you some of the reasons why, as a, as a non-scientist, I find the, the, the teachings of, of evolution to be uh, beautiful and powerful and, uh, and an asset to my, to my spiritual journey. So let me, let me just share four of those with you, and I want to hear your responses and, and how you might even elaborate or expand on these. First of all, um, there has been some disagreement in church history about whether God is the author of natural law or whether he is the most perfect student of natural law. And I incline toward the latter um, belief. I think that that's substantiated in our scriptural canon as well as in Joseph Smith's original teachings. So what makes God God is the fact that he lives in perfect harmony with and mastery of the laws that govern reality. And so I think that evolution seems to be perfectly compatible with that kind of an understanding of God, that he would work in concert with the kinds of natural laws that we see around us. And so I think that my faith as a Latter-day Saint exempts me from the problem of having to reconcile a kind of interventionist God or a sovereign deity who manipulates and controls and orchestrates reality with, with scientific natural law. So I find that, that there's a beautiful congruence there between, between those two paradigms. Would you agree? I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I, that's basically what I think as well. That doesn't mean that I don't... I, I would not. I would be okay with a God that had to intervene. I, I'm okay with that. You know, I, I've told this story before where, you know, we were down in St. George and we were watching this play and it was about ready to rain a little bit, and and so my wife was praying that it didn't rain, but the farmers next door it was in a drought and they were praying that it rained and it ended up not raining. And she looked at me and she said, you know, we need to thank God that we didn't get rain during the play. And I said, and I said, well, what about the farmers? And I said, maybe it just didn't rain because it didn't rain. And, and that was a big discord between us. But, it, but it, it's made me think a lot about, you know, does God intervene or doesn't he? Um, I don't know the answer. I like the idea that maybe God intervenes more with hearts right. than with matter. Right. And that's the way I like to think about the, the God intervening. He intervenes with people and their hearts and tries to help them help others. And those are the miracles. Good. Good. Um, my second reason for loving evolution is that it gives us a portrait of an open-ended universe. Hmm. And I want to believe that I inhabit an open-ended universe, even one that includes God, that is still open-ended. You know, philosophers have long debated the question, does God's foreknowledge preclude freedom? Um, I think there, there are good arguments against that. Uh, one of the best is by the theologian Richard Swinburne who says, well, God knows everything that exists and the future doesn't exist, therefore it doesn't constitute part of his knowledge because there isn't any future yet. Uh, I agree with that. I personally don't want to live in a universe where God knows what I'm going to eat for supper tonight. Um, I mean, maybe he does, but I, I want to believe that, that in some matters, large as well as small, that I can surprise God. Um, otherwise, among other reasons, I wouldn't want to be God um, if all you watch is reruns. Um, and it seems to me that evolution presents us with that kind of a universe, yeah. characterized by the radical intrusion of novelty. That that it's this great adventure. Uh, there, there's a there's a, a creative spontaneity and unpredictability to it all that makes it. A, that's the only kind of universe that will never grow old through the eons of eternity. And uh, so it seems to me that science has here given us a very powerful kind of prelude to what may be in, in, in store for all of us. Yeah. I ex yes. I love that. That resonates with me. And that's why I'm an evolutionary biologist. I mean, I have the best job in the world because I get to, to study and look at all of this marvelous diversity, complexity, simpleness also that comes out of evolution. And it's like, if I'm God, I don't want a hundred worlds that are all doing the same thing. I want a hundred yeah. worlds that are going yeah. in different directions. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. 
a, a third reason for my, my love of evolution is um, that it's congruent with what, what my, uh, my son uses his expression, his blogs, he calls life difficult by design. Mm. And I think that, you know, that's one of the greatest misconceptions that we labor under as members of the church, is that if we follow a certain covenant path, that we will be assured a certain kind of tranquility and blessedness in our lives, which I think is, is couldn't be further from the truth. Um, and, right, Darwin was the first who taught us that, that opposition in the sense of violent contestation and agon and struggle and... and and hostile, uh, you're right, hostile environments are, are the precondition for any meaningful development. Mm. And it seems to me that that's the cardinal principle that explains why we are in a life as difficult as this one. You have to either believe, like as a Protestant or a Calvinist or most Catholics, that we are here in this veil of tears because of some screw up by Adam and Eve, or you have to believe that we're here because there are inalterable, unalterable principles of, of, of the universe, that, that reality is structured in such a way that there is no getting around difficulty and cognitive dissonance and struggle uh, if we want to evolve into something higher and better. Yeah. And if you accept that complexity of evolution, the messiness that sometimes I like to talk about, you know, that I think forces us to have more mercy for those individuals that are different than we are. Yeah. Yeah. In many, many ways, because biology is real. This is not something that you choose. You are what you are. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of epigenetics and, and, and you know, nurturing at, at play. But by and large, you are what you are. And sometimes people get a, a messy biology laid out to them. And if we understand evolution, and it's because of this tinkering that's happening. It's because of, of random mechanisms of evolution, such as genetic drift and mutation, working hand in hand with directional mechanisms of evolution like natural selection and non-random mating, then you get this you get this wonderful outcome of messiness. Right. And if we and if we celebrate that, yeah, I think it I think it helps us have more mercy for those that maybe aren't like the other ninety nine percent. Yeah. 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 Good. Um, fourth, and this may be more unexpected, um, this is my fourth reason. I'll, I'll begin with a, a, a witticism that is commonly heard among theologians, and that is that original sin is the only empirical, empirically verifiable dogma. <laughs> um, if you look around, it seems pretty evident that, yeah, we're inheritors of some pretty bad stuff. And I know that even Latter-day Saints, I, I, I keep encountering Latter-day Saints who want to incline toward Calvinism. They want to see in the Book of Mormon, right, a kind of attestation that we are all wretched, depraved individuals. The natural man is an enemy to God. It's a misreading of that verse. But, but it seems to me that, that, that Darwin is our rescuer. If we're going to make some kind of rational accounting of the fact that we are all prideful, selfish, lustful, greedy people by, by inheritance or, or, or conditioning, and we don't want to accept that as an Adamic inheritance and punishment, Darwin gives us the perfect explanation for that, right? We are evolutionarily conditioned to look out for number one. Um, principles of self-preservation and, and self-aggrandizement are wired into our biology. And so it seems to me that Darwin is one of the greatest theological rescuers that we have. Yeah, potentially. So he was he was uh, inspired, right, to do this? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, and I like I, coming a little bit back to the intervention of God. I think that that messiness and this what you're getting at also allows us to understand a little bit better why doesn't God intervene in all of the craziness and the you know the sex trades and you know all of this terrible stuff, natural disasters and everything. Why doesn't he go down and save these people if? It, and he doesn't because he's, he, he realizes this is the process he's decided to use. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I think I've come to grips that I'm okay with that. I mean, it's terrible, and it makes me weep, and it makes God weep, as your book has so eloquently explained. But um, I think evolution is the great explanation of that, and that yeah. we can be okay with it because yeah. God's okay with it. Yeah. yeah. Now, let me, I want to turn to a question here at this point. It's my understanding that the post... Darwin intellectual history of the West um, largely conceived of Darwinism as a crisis 
not, or, or is presenting a kind of creating a crisis of faith, not because it obviated the need for God. I think that kind of comes later, towards the end of the 19th century, we get, we get that. But the immediate concern was, wait a minute, he's just eliminated the qualitative barrier that separates us from the animals. And we now become one with the natural world in a way that there's, right, there's no radical differentiation between us and a shrew or an octopus. And, and that was disconcerting not to their beliefs about God as much as their beliefs about what it meant to be human. Yeah. Um, how do you, as a disciple, feel about that collapse, that kind of ontological collapse, right, of the human into the biological? Yeah, and that, w that was, you know, what some of those hard things to get through early on in my career. I, I celebrate the process of evolution that we are as great as a shrew. A shrew is just as evolved as we are. And that is the physical body. For me, what really matters, for me and my Heavenly Father, is that I am His Son. And that is because of my spirit. It has nothing to do with my physical body. Right. It only has to do with my spirit. And I chose to make covenants with him and with others on this planet and to try to treat others well. And so that, it, for me, that, that collapse is, doesn't need to happen. I think we can still celebrate how wonderful all of life is, how wonderful every single evolutionary adaptation is, including what's on a human body. Great. Yeah. But I think mayflies are just as cool as humans. Yeah. Right? But what really separates us and keeps us separate, in my mind, in my in, in, in my belief is that I am a son of God and that I can make covenants with him. Right. Let me end with a concluding thought on my part and then I'll ask you for your last thought. Um, you've read Darwin and taught Darwin. I've read Darwin and taught Darwin, um, not within a science curriculum but within a humanities curriculum. And what has always struck me about Darwin's writing is how concerned he is to find a surrogate for the sense of the sacred that he realizes he is in process of diminishing. And so he tries to console on, on almost every page by celebrating and emphasizing the, the beauty and the sublimity of evolutionary processes. And he ends his volume, I think it's the first sentence of the last paragraph, where he says, yeah, in the, yeah, in the last there, is, paragraph. there is grandeur in this view of life. Yeah. And I don't think he's just playing to a particular audience. I think he means that. I think he feels that. And uh, could you just say a little bit about, about the grandeur um, in this view of life that has come to you as a, as a scientist and a student of evolution? Yeah, um, I love that paragraph. And in that paragraph, in his first edition, you know, he even uses the word creator. Right. Right. And they're giving permission, and probably because he's married to Emma and yeah. wants to stay married to Emma. Yeah. But... Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I've had those moments of epiphany when I've been out in the field or when I've maybe gotten to that point where a paper was accepted or something, you know. But I remember one moment in time when I was in Peru. And we were in the middle of the Amazon jungle and we had climbed up a metal staircase in the middle of the rainforest. And we had lugged in a generator on our back and it was down on the floor and then we had a cord, an extension cord up with these bright lights, right, to attract insects. Most people want insects to go yeah. away, but we want them to come in. And I'll never forget standing there, and it was a little bit of rain, and just the diversity of things that were flying around me and landing on me. And I've got pictures of this, and you can see like the big stuff, but you can't see the little tiny things. And I was just blown away by diversity, and it was almost a religious moment for me in time. And, uh, you know, I can think about that and it just gets, you know, chills, almost like I'm bearing my testimony, how cool yeah, it was. Yeah. And then I, as I learn about how, what is the process that created that diversity, that, that brought about that diversity, and I recognize that it's evolution, it makes me have that wonder and awe for evolution. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I know that I'm grateful to belong to a religious tradition that invites us uh, to be not just subjects but peers, eventually, with God. Mm. And, uh, and that, as a consequence, invites us to engage in the work of, of intellectual exploration with a kind of zest for the, uh, the richness and the profundities of, of the universe that's out there. Yeah.
So thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.